welcome everybody uh, to our PSR webinar tonight. Um, I am Jillian Graber, the Executive Director of Protect PT, and um, we have um, a lot, lots of folks here tonight. First, I want to introduce on tech. We've got um, Kevin Richardson and Ryan Clover Owens from Halt the Harm Network. <laughs> We've got Dusty Horowitz from uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, he's going to be leading most of the conversation here. Um, and so uh, talking about their wonderful report, we also have um, Jackson Zeiler from um, the Environmental Health Project here, um, going to discuss some, some slides as well. Uh, we have Matt Kelso from Frack Tracker Alliance, uh, and Tammy Murphy is here. She is with Physicians for Social Responsibility PA. Um, so welcome everybody. I, I don't, I think I got everybody. Um, and so we're going to go ahead to the next screen. Great. Okay. So I uh, made this slide with everybody's um, everybody's uh, web pages. So please, if you're joining us today, check out the web pages of all the different partner organizations that um, have put work into um, putting this wonderful presentation together tonight for you all. And uh, we have 127 people signed up. So that is very exciting. <laughs> we're going to hopefully have a, a robust conversation tonight. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to go through some, some Zoom etiquette really quick. Um, please stay on mute uh, until we have our Q&A session at the end. And then, <clears throat> so, and then that'll be a time for, for you all to ask the questions that you have. Um, and so um, I'm going to then go ahead and hand it over to Dusty. We're gonna we're gonna uh, look at Dusty's slides and then Matt Kelso will present uh, as well as then Jackson. Um, I'll be presenting some some material as well. And then uh, Tammy um, will be presenting at the end uh, and then we'll have a call to action. So uh, if you go ahead to the next screen, Dusty, go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks so much, Julian. I'm going to be talking about Physicians for Social Responsibilities new report, Fracking with Forever Chemicals in Pennsylvania. This report is one of a series of reports that Physicians for Social Responsibility has been publishing on the use of PFAS or per and polyfluoroalkyl substances um, in oil and gas wells. These um, substances are also known as forever chemicals because they are resistant to breaking down in the environment. Um, they're also extremely toxic, uh, as I'll demonstrate. Um, what our, our, uh, our publications began in July of 2021 when we published a report um, that was the result of analyzing a digital pile of thousands of records from the US EPA that showed how EPA regulators had analyzed, uh, assessed, and then either uh, approved for commercial use or not, um, chemicals that had been proposed for use in oil and gas drilling. EPA conducted these reviews under the Federal Toxic Substances Control Act. And what we found in these thousands of records was one particular record in which EPA scientists had identified three chemicals proposed for use in oil and gas wells that they believed could break down into a PFOA-like substance. And PFOA is perhaps the most infamous type of PFAS, um, highly toxic and associated with multiple negative health effects. And so that discovery led us to analyze where and when uh, PFAS might have been used in oil and gas wells. Um, and so this report tonight um, is one of the, the results of that discovery in those thousands of pages of EPA records several years ago. So let me uh, begin uh, by talking about uh, some background on PFAS, what they are, and why we're so concerned about the use of these chemicals in uh, oil and gas wells. Um, and, and I want to emphasize at the outset that what I want to do and what we wanted to do with this report is to um, 
educate Pennsylvanians, uh, residents and uh, government officials on the limited scope of what we know about PFAS use in oil and gas wells in Pennsylvania, and also the much larger scope of PFAS use that could be hidden from public view by Pennsylvania's lax chemical disclosure rules. So what do we know about PFAS? One, uh, PFAS has a lot of valuable properties. Uh, they are oil and water resistant. They're very slippery, and so they can be used as lubricants. And they've been used up and down the economy for decades, since the 1940s, uh, because of those valuable properties. But they also have some very negative properties, including these on the screen. They don't break down in the environment. Um, they're toxic at microscopic concentrations. To give an idea of how toxic they can be, the US EPA recently issued proposed drinking water standards for six different types of PFAS, including the one I mentioned earlier, PFOA. And they set the maximum contaminant level for PFOA in drinking water at just four parts per trillion. At that concentration, one measuring cup of PFOA would be enough to contaminate 28 billion gallons of drinking water, which is more than 90 times the amount of drinking water that the city of Philadelphia treats for customers every day. Um, so they're, they're toxic at very low concentrations. Uh, they spread easily in water and they have been linked to multiple negative health impacts, which we'll see on the next slide here. Uh, this is this information is from the US EPA and the Centers for Disease Control. It shows that um, PFAS, uh, can, and can you enlarge the graphic just a little bit, please, if that's possible. Um, uh, PFAS has uh, have been um, linked to multiple neg negative health effects, including um, testicular cancer, uh, high cholesterol, uh, high blood pressure in pregnant women, a condition known as preeclampsia, uh, vaccine resistance, and uh, and also uh, kidney cancer. Um, next slide, please. Uh, another reason that we're concerned about the use of PFAS in oil and gas wells is because there are multiple pathways through which PFAS and other dangerous chemicals used in oil and gas operations can get out into the environment and potentially come into contact with people. Um, this slide shows the uh, an underground look at an oil and gas well from the US EPA. And it shows multiple ways that uh, contaminants can break out of oil and gas wells and get into the groundwater. Now, when oil and gas wells are drilled, they initially, drilling companies initially bore straight down through the earth and rock, going right through the groundwater in the initial leg of drilling before they put into the well um, steel casing, which is this, what you see running down the center of the well, or, two, or cement, which is opposite on opposite sides of that steel casing. And the cement is pumped down the steel casing, it hits the bottom of the well, and then fills back up alongside of the well, uh, alongside of the casing to the surface. What the companies want is to form an in, impenetrable seal between that well and the groundwater. But when they're, when they're drilling that initial leg, they go right through the groundwater before installing that. And then what this, what this slide shows is that even after they install the steel casing and cement, it can leak and crack in various ways. And EPA has shown five different ways that uh, fluids from inside that well can get out into uh, the groundwater. And next slide, please. Um, there are also multiple pathways in oil and gas operations uh, through which oil and gas waste can contaminate groundwater, surface water, soil. Um, this is a fluids impoundment in Washington County, Pennsylvania. Um, this is one of seven uh, fluid impoundments that had leaks and spills associated with them that caused soil and groundwater contamination and led the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection in 2014 to fine the company responsible for these impoundments, uh, range resources, more than $4 million. Um, so you can have um, you know, leaks and spills above ground and the size, you can see the size of this impoundment 
um, on the screen, how it dwarfs the machinery and equipment on the well site. Companies use enormous amounts of fluid in their drilling and fracking operations. Fracking typically involves injecting underground into the well uh, millions of gallons of water mixed with sand and chemicals. And then after that fracking is, um, after the fracking fluid is pushed in at very high pressure, the companies turn off the pressure and that causes the fluid to reverse and come up and out of the well and you get wastewater, which is a mix of those um, human uh, laboratory made chemicals that were injected into the well and fracking and possibly drilling and then also some of the naturally occurring contaminants that can be downhole like radioactive radium and when that comes up in the form of wastewater you can have leaks and spills um, and that can be uh, transported sometimes miles from the well site for disposal so those communities can also be impacted quickly i just want to say that there can also be some air pathways for contamination uh, from oil and gas wells that could spread PFAS through the air, including uh, flaring at the wellhead when some of the uh, methane is burned off at, at, the, at the gas well. Um, some PFAS could escape in that uh, flaring operation and be deposited on surface water or soil and could be spread for significant distances from the well. Next slide, please. So uh, working in conjunction with um, our data analyst, uh, Gary Allison, who runs a website called Open Frack Focus and working with uh, Frack Tracker Alliance, um, who is represented here tonight uh, by Matt Kelso, um, we looked at a database called Frack Focus to determine or try to determine where PFAS had been used in oil and gas wells or unconventional gas wells in Pennsylvania. Now in under Pennsylvania law, oil and gas companies have to disclose the fracking chemicals that they use in unconventional gas wells. These are the wells that have led to the surge in gas production over the last couple of decades. And they have to disclose those chemicals to this database called Frack Focus, which is a non-governmental organization. The public can look at these records and find out well by well where these chemicals have been injected, with an important exception, which is that Pennsylvania law allows the oil and gas companies to withhold from this disclosure um, chemicals that are labeled trade secrets, uh, because either the companies doing the fracking or the drilling or the chemical manufacturers do not want their competitors uh, or perhaps the public to find out what these chemicals are. So th this map shows where the wells are located that we identified as being injected with PFAS. The, these are marked with red dots. They're all on the Western Pennsylvania border. And these show wells that were injected with a PFAS called PTFE, otherwise known as Teflon, which is known for its slipperiness. We can't be sure what the PTFE was used for, um, but we do know that these wells were injected during fracking with PTFE. Um, the blue dots um, represent wells that were injected with some type of trade secret surfactants. Um, surfactants are um, of interest because they encompass a subcategory of chemicals called fluorosurfactants that are often PFAS. We can't be sure exactly what these um, surfactants are, but we know that the companies um, used some kind of surfactant in, in more than 1,200 wells in Pennsylvania over the past decade um, that were labeled as surfactants. And then the gold dots uh, represent wells that were injected with some type of trade secret chemical, whether a surfactant or something else. Um, any of these trade secret chemicals, our concern is uh, could be PFAS. And that means that Pennsylvanians could be unknowingly exposed to PFAS, um, either the type of PFAS that were injected into these wells during fracking or perhaps a breakdown product of these PFAS uh, when they break down inside the well um, under heat and pressure and mixed with other chemicals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this shows a county by county list of where 
the trade secret chemicals and trade secret surfactants were injected. Uh, there were, were almost 30 counties in Pennsylvania where oil and gas companies over the last decade injected at least one trade secret chemical into a well. There were more than 5,000 wells injected with a staggering 160 million pounds of trade secret chemicals. That's an enormous, enormous quantity. And then um, more than 1,200 wells in more than 20 counties were injected with at least one trade secret surfactant, and those totaled almost 5 million pounds. Next slide, please. Um, there are several pieces of evidence that lead us to believe that these trade secret chemicals might be PFAS. At least some of them could be PFAS. Uh, one is a paper that was just published by the U.S. Geological Survey and the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, uh, which recognized oil and gas wells as among the facilities that have been documented as potential sources of PFAS. Um, and that paper, in turn, cited two other uh, published papers that we cited in our report. Uh, one was a 2020 paper by uh, Julianne Glug, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, um, and other authors which surveyed PFAS use across multiple industries and found that since 1956, uh, various types of PFAS have been at least proposed for use in oil and gas wells, if not actually used in the wells for a variety of purposes, including drilling, uh, fracking, and chemical flooding. And then a 2008 paper um, published by uh, in an oil and gas industry journal uh, found that uh, fluorosurfactants, which were described in, in a way that was very consistent with PFAS in the paper, um, had been used for four decades in the oil and gas industry. Uh, and then finally, we found evidence in reviewing the frac focus records that 15 companies operating oil and gas or unconventional gas wells in Pennsylvania um, had used PFAS in their oil and gas wells in other states, but did not report using those PFAS in Pennsylvania, leading to the question about whether maybe they were using those chemicals in Pennsylvania, but not disclosing them publicly. Uh, I should add that in addition to using trade secret chemical, trade secret protections to hide chemical use in Pennsylvania. Uh, oil and gas companies also do not have to disclose any of the chemicals that they use in drilling the well, which is that initial process when they bore down through the groundwater. Um, and chemical manufacturers, which are the companies in the best position to know what chemicals are being used in the oil and gas wells, do not have to disclose their chemicals in Pennsylvania and in many other states and there is evidence that uh, those chemical manufacturers often do not disclose all of the contents of their chemical products to the end users who drill and frack the wells, who then cannot possibly disclose those chemicals to the public, leading to a situation where people could be unknowingly exposed to PFAS or other harmful substances. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a, a table from our report showing examples of specific wells that were injected with some of the chemicals that we highlighted. Um, you can see the bottom two rows. Um, uh, one is a range resources well from 2015. It was injected with a, some kind of proprietary surfactants and the amount of the surfactants injected into that well was more than 35,000 pounds. That's an enormous amount, especially um, if that type of chemical might be uh, PFAS. Uh, then the last entry here, a Seneca Resources Corporation well um, also was injected with a proprietary surfactant blend in a quantity of more than 23,000 pounds. And again, depending on um, what kind of substance that is, that could be an enormous amount of uh, material and very toxic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our report gives users the ability to pinpoint wells where either a PFAS or a trade secret chemical was used. Um, you can see on this screen, um, if you if you uh, zoom in on the interactive map, which is available in the report, and then you click on the individual dots for individual wells, you'll get this data screen that comes up. And the first piece of information in the data screen is called an API number that is a unique identifier for each well. And then what you, and this well is a well that was injected with PTFE or Teflon, as you can see um, in the uh, fourth entry down from the top. Uh, next slide, please. 
you can then take that API number and you can go to Frack Focus, which has a feature called Find a Well. You put that API number in their field that says API Well Number, and then you hit um, you hit Search Jobs. Next slide, please. Uh, you'll see this page that has um, a couple of uh, disclosures um, for this particular well. And then if you click on that first disclosure, you'll see the following. Next slide, please. Um, this is the uh, hydraulic fracturing chemical disclosure form for this well um, in Lawrence County in Western Pennsylvania. And uh, you can see um, I've put red arrows by the API number at the top of that form. That um, That's that that through line through all these records, the API number allows you to track this, this well and the associated records. And then next slide, please. Uh, you can see down toward the bottom of this chemical disclosure form, um, the company has disclosed using uh, PTFE or Teflon as one of the fracking chemicals in this well. And I'll just add that um, the concern about PTFE is not so much the PTFE itself. This uh, It's like a plastic. The concern is that the PTFE or Teflon uh, may have been uh, manufactured with very toxic fluorosurfactants, and those impurities may remain on the PTFE, and then when it's used, they could break off in the environment um, and cause pollution. Next slide, please. Um, this, uh, this slide, uh, which I think we'll hear more about later, um, shows that the concern is not just at the well site or near the well site where the PFAS is used or may be used. Um, the waste generated from the well site can be taken uh, miles away for disposal. The yellow triangles on the map here um, created by Frack Tracker Alliance show uh, the different waste disposal sites where um, waste from these wells injected with PTFE were taken. Next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to show an example of a well that was injected with a trade secret surfactant. Um, this well is in uh, far northeastern Pennsylvania. As you saw on the earlier map, the, the big clusters of drilling in Pennsylvania are in southwest Pennsylvania and northeast Pennsylvania. Um, this well was injected with a trade secret surfactant, um, as you can see here, where it says wells with trade secret surfactants. Um, and it says true next to it. Um, and this is not too far uh, from both the New York border, uh, which is that line running uh, vertically toward the middle of the screen. It's also uh, not too far from the uh, Delaware River Basin. You can see on the far uh, right-hand side of the map, there's a green uh, highlighted uh, meandering river. That's the, the Delaware River. Um, and so one of the concerns that uh, people have is the potential for waste disposal um, near the Delaware River that could um, get into the Delaware. Uh, next slide, please. Um, finally, our report contains a number of recommendations. Uh, the first is halting the use of PFAS in oil and gas extraction and then expanding public disclosure. These two steps were taken last year in a law passed by the state of Colorado. Uh, this law bans the use of PFAS in oil and gas wells and then also um, significantly improves chemical disclosure in the state. And we believe it's a model that Pennsylvania and other states uh, should look to, to help protect people uh, and the environment from the risks of PFAS use in oil and gas operations. Uh, with that, I will stop and uh, turn it back. Thank you, Dusty. What a very thorough report. Um, we appreciate you going over all that information with us. Um, I just want I, I just want to make sure that people know what we're talking about when we talk about surfactants. Somebody asked me this question um, uh, the other day. Can you just kind of um, really briefly before we move on um, tell us what a surfactant is and what its function is in, in this whole system? Since we've heard a lot about them. Sure. Um, Surfactants reduce the surface tension um, between two liquids or a liquid and a solid. They're, they're basically, um, they're often used as lubricants, like soap would be an example. Um, and you know, PFAS are maybe the ultimate surfactant um, because they're so slippery. Teflon, when it was invented, was immediately recognized for um, how uh, slippery it was. And so they're you know, we can only speculate about why these chemicals were used in oil and gas wells in Pennsylvania and in other states. Uh, one reason might be 
because um, during the fracking process, a class of chemical that is typically used is a friction reducer, which uh, reduces the friction inside the well, which in turn reduces the need um, to, to uh, burn energy to uh, force the fluid into the well at high pressure. Um, so that's that's a possibility. But they, they basically, um, you know, surfactants are often used as lubricants. Thank you so much for, for letting us um, into that um, into that conversation, Dusty. I really appreciate all the work that you all put into this report. We are going to provide the link for you all at the end of this presentation. We're also going to be providing some information on how to take some next steps, as, as Dusty mentioned. Um, so next we have the next part of our presentation, which is, you know, now that we know that this report is is happening, what does it mean for frontline communities? And first up, we have Matt Kelso, uh, Manager of Data and Technology at Frack Tracker Alliance. So go ahead, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Jillian. Um, so this report obviously just came out, um, uh, but a little bit of a preview for it. Uh, PSR had released some other reports on other states earlier. And there was a footnote in the Ohio uh, report that talked about some of the wells with uh, PS uh, with uh, uh, PFAS in Pennsylvania. And uh, I was reached out to by uh, Chris, Christina Marusik of Environmental Health News, and she was wondering if it was possible to determine what happened to the waste that was created from uh, these wells. So these are the same eight wells that Dusty was talking about earlier. Uh, if you take off all the wells that have, um, uh, you know, the trade secret surfactants and the trade secret chemicals, and you're left with the wells that are um, listed as uh, those containing PFAS chemicals. So um, next slide, please. So these are the locations where the waste for those eight wells go. Uh, or 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 have gone so far. Um, to make this map, I looked at the waste data dating back to the first um, spud date, so the first drill date of these eight wells. So that went back to 2012. And I comprehends a picture of the destination and amount of all the waste that um, were generated from these wells. Um, this isn't something you can do in every state. This is pretty unique to Pennsylvania um, because we find out a lot about the waste, how it's processed and where it goes. Um, and so in this case, all of the receiving facilities were in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. Um, but for some other wells in the past, uh, waste from Pennsylvania wells have gone as far as you know Michigan and Texas and Idaho. Uh, so it really can go all over the place. Um, we know that um, there are 90 different facilities here that, that accepted waste, uh, including injection wells, landfills, processing facilities, temporary storage facilities, and other well sites. Some of this waste does get used in the fracking of additional wells. So if you really want to track it, then you can see where did the waste from those wells go. We didn't do any of that. But anyway, can we look at the next slide, please? Here's a little data uh, about the waste from those eight wells. So um, since 2012, we have 554,667 barrels of liquid waste and 30,930 tons of solid waste. Um, these wells tend to generate considerably more liquid waste than solid waste, and they'll generate liquid waste every year. Um, so the solid waste it might be mostly drill cuttings, for example. Um, I mean, you can see the different uh, waste types here on the right. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a really appreciable amount of waste. Um, for those who aren't used to thinking of waste in terms of uh, barrels, one barrel is 42 gallons. So 554,667 barrels is about 20.3 million gallons of, of fluid that has to be dealt with in one way or another. Um, about 360,000 barrels or 65% of all this liquid waste uh, went to uh, injection wells, uh, waste disposal wells. 
and about 131,000 barrels, which is about 24%, went to uh, re-stimulate additional fracking wells. I think that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. So I think um, based on the conversation that um, that we just had and, and the the things that that Matt added, um, we can uh, we can look for a few things. So right here um, we have a couple pictures of stuff that's going on in Penn Township. Um, so the the picture on the, the left hand side is the Metis well pad in Penn Township. And um, so you can see this is what a typical pad looks like uh, when they're doing fracking. Um, you you can see the freshwater pond there, um, or at least you know that's what that's what the function uh, is supposed to be used for. You can see all the trucks uh, with there's sand, there's chemicals, uh, the containers of those things on the pad, uh, and the crane ready to to put those into the well uh, to be able to to uh, frack that well. So with all of this stuff on the pad, um, it is uh, the the PFAS is being used on the pad um, as we've discussed, but then also uh, to your right, you're going to see a residual waste truck. And so as Dusty mentioned and, and Matt mentioned, um, the the waste is a big component of uh, the where um, where the PFAS is is really ending up because it's not just, used on the pad and then poof disappears, it, it has to go somewhere, um, which is why disclosure um, would be a really important step for Pennsylvania to take um, because we just don't know, um, you know, what is what is in that uh, residual waste truck. We don't know um, if PFAS was used at those wells, and we don't know if, um, as Matt pointed out, it's used at one well and then used to re-stimulate another well, uh, where the origin of that those chemicals are. So, so even if you don't have a well pad in your backyard, you still could have um, a PFAS exposure um, based on these factors. And so, you know, that, that means that folks in communities all over Pennsylvania uh, and our neighboring states could um, be exposed to PFAS uh, unknowingly. Um, so if you go to the next slide. I also want to mention um, really quick, you know, this is just one example of fracking happening around major water body sources uh, of fresh drinking water. So this is actually the Beaver Run Reservoir in um, in Westmoreland County, where I live. Uh, and you can see, um, as, as Dusty mentioned earlier, with the Delaware River and fracking happening so close to the Delaware River, you can see that there are several well pads that are very, very close to uh, several hundred feet <laughs> um, up to the, the um, um, drinking water for 150,000 people in Westmoreland County, Allegheny County, uh, neighboring <clears throat> uh, Indiana County, and, and other counties as well. Uh, you can see actually a picture from Marcellus Air here on the left of the deer mitt pad. Uh, and you can just visualize, um, which is why I wanted to add this, this graphic here, visualize exactly how close that pad is to the, the edge of the water. So if there are any spills, if there are any releases or leaks um, during fracking, uh, this could have a potential to to cause PFOS to get into the drinking water system. And so that, you know, really exacerbates the problem. Um, I have some good news about Beaver Run, though. Um, we were at their source water protection meeting on uh, last week, and uh, they are starting to test for PFOS. Uh, and thank goodness they are, um, because in particular around Beaver Run, the operator CNX um, has had several spills uh, and have been cited multiple times, over 26 times by uh, the DEP for, for spills and releases at the pad. Um, so you can see that this, this can be a really widespread issue if we don't have some type of a disclosure or a way to test for PFAS um, uh, in our drinking water. So if we go ahead to the next slide. Um, and the problem um, can compound uh, with um, some other other things. So um, yes, there are drill cuttings. Um, this is a, a, a leachate poster that we have drill cuttings that come up from the pad, then go to the to the um, the landfill or waste dump. But there are some fluids um, that get solidified. Um, so these fluids are sometimes not quite 
um, solid, not quite liquid, um, but they're used, um, you know, the, they're mixed with uh, bonding agents, um, solidification agents like uh, fly ash or you know, sawdust, and they're solidified. And then that goes um, as solid waste into our landfills uh, here in Pennsylvania and beyond. And, and so then when it rains, <laughs> the liquid that had become solid then can become liquid again uh, and end up in these leachate ponds uh, and containment units. And then um, in the case of, you know, s several times we've seen that um, this, this um, leachate then ends up um, being processed or not quite processed and put, could potentially go into our drinking water. So this is another potential pathway. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jackson Zeiler. He is the public health analyst with the Environmental Health Project. So go ahead, Jackson. Yeah, thank you, Jillian. Um, and I, I really uh, thought it was important to kind of reiterate a lot of the um, a lot of the health outcomes uh, of PFAS, as well as um, with the environmental systems through which PFAS can enter the body. And uh, Dusty's part of the presentation really went into a lot of this already, but um, so not to belabor that point, but um, this uh, it is from a public health perspective and a health protection standpoint, something that we definitely wanted to reiterate um, as many participants on this call are probably working with communities or are uh, indeed in, uh, members of an affected community themselves. Um, so, uh, this uh, uh, is just one example of a, of, of a PFAS molecule here. We can see this um, carbon fluorine bond, not to uh, bring back uh, nightmares of uh, high school chemistry like it does for me, but not necessarily super important. But um, that carbon fluorine bond or the uh, perfluorocarbon moiety is known as, um, those are some of the strongest atomic bonds known to science. So um, that makes them inherently really difficult to break down at an atomic level, um, which as we can kind of uh, understand as we start to see where this is entering uh, water streams and as was mentioned several times before these aren't uh, breaking down naturally in in the environment there's there's really no way for them to naturally do so and um, ways to do them intentionally whether those, those are either very complex um, uh, sort of cleaning processes that are either uh, energy intensive expensive um, or or just uh, very scientifically complex um, so that's kind of one of the reasons why, from a, I guess a, an atomic standpoint, that's going to be one of the reasons why those are very difficult to break down. Um, if we can go to the next slide, we can start looking at some of the um, potential health effects that, again, we already did look into, but some of the major ones being um, uh, on the right side there. Um, that's from uh, the, the European Environment Agency, uh, basically a, a similar agency to the EPA in Europe. Um, but uh, several animal and human studies have indicated that uh, there's uh, a variety of downstream health outcomes. Um, main ones being uh, accumulation in the liver, just because uh, as it does in the environment, this uh, PFAS does not break down. Uh, the bodily systems cannot break down PFAS uh, naturally. So that's just gonna accumulate mainly in the liver, um, lead, uh, but also in other parts of the body as well, leading to factor, uh, other, other factors, um, kidney cancers, um, uh, small birth weights, um, increased risk of uh, kidney and testicular cancer. One alarming one being a uh, decreased vaccine response, um, which uh, is another uh, more relevant um, uh, outcome as well. Um, but yes, uh, these are some of the main uh, uh, health effects as well. And then for the next slide, how these are reaching the body, we did see uh, as Dusty also mentioned from an oil and gas standpoint, a lot of those wastewater um, uh, how that's how uh, wastewater PFAS is getting a lot of the, the wastewater pathway, but um, and this is this is labeled as water cycle, but it's generally not. Uh, it's it's a generally a good diagram to to demonstrate all the all the pathways leading uh, that PFAS can lead to the to to human bodies essentially, um, and that's largely from industry or uh, and, and wastewater. Um, uh, somebody uh, I already saw a comment earlier uh, in the call of somebody indicating that uh, some of those PFAS had settled from being um, uh, discharged into the air uh, and, and found its way into the soil, uh, soil pathway. Um, so again, this looks uh, relatively simple, but uh, there you can see how complex a lot of these pathways are, but how ultimately a lot of those are leading to residential homes or soil farmland and 
um, getting into uh, uh, food products, as well as products that people are just bringing into their homes, um, whether they're treated with PFAS or um, those are materials that are uh, are built with or, or or liquids that are entering the home that way. Um, so we can kind of see that even without, um, even if we take away PFAS um, that's released from oil and gas in Pennsylvania, we can already, already kind of see that this is a massive health concern. Um, but because of that oil and gas capability, the industry capability of retaining information on those disclosures um, and when and where these materials can be used, um, we start to see, it starts to paint a picture of the uh, extent of PFAS in this region, how that can be uh, extremely, potentially even more serious than than we understand at this time. So um, with that, I wanted to hand it back to you, Jillian, I believe. Thank you very much. All right. So next up, we have Tammy Murphy. She is the Advocate Director for Physicians for Social Responsibility, Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Tammy, and go to the next slide, please. Okay. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I am Tammy Murphy. I'm the Advocacy Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility, Pennsylvania. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some comparative things, I guess, in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So only when the public became aware of PFAS as an emerging, life-lasting, widespread contaminant did the Federal Environmental Protection Agency create stricter, yet not yet still not enforceable, drinking water health ad, um, advisory guidelines. These federal guidelines merely raised awareness and allowed for the collection of additional data. Surprisingly, ahead of the EPA, Pennsylvania created our own enforceable maximum contaminant levels for PFAS chemicals in drinking water, um, specifically for public drinking water systems through the Environmental Quality Board early this year. Um, after examining the risk to human health and conducting a statewide testing program. Now that we know of another risky source of PFAS, thanks to Dusty's research through PSR National, we in Pennsylvania need to adapt. We need to protect human health from exposure by restricting the use of PFAS in the unconventional gas development industry and not allow the industry to keep use of such health threatening toxins as proprietary secrets. Despite the starkly different political atmosphere in Colorado's legislature, we can learn from Colorado's response to a similar report PSR National released about PFAS use in Colorado's oil and gas wells. Six months prior to Pennsylvania establishing our maximum contaminant levels, Colorado's governor was already signing into law their House Bill 1348, prohibiting the use of PFAS in oil and gas wells and improving regulations on the disclosure of oil and gas chemicals. Mm. For advocacy purposes here in Pennsylvania, it is worth noting that Colorado also had another version of the legislation uh, that was House Bill 1345, which separated the prohibition of the use of PFAS in oil and gas wells from the improvements to the regulations on disclosure of oil and gas chemicals. Also noteworthy, for organizing advocacy purposes here in Pennsylvania, advocates in Colorado, including PSR's Colorado chapter, are currently working toward improving the implementation of their House Bill 1348 through their Energy and Carbon Management Commission, uh, the ECMC. They are asking the ECMC ran to, I'm sorry, they're asking that the ECMC randomly test flowback in the wells to see if the chemicals found are consistent with those that the industry operators have disclosed or if PFAS is identified. The steps that Colorado has taken can offer us a template to customize to suit the environmental landscape in Pennsylvania. We can build upon the Environmental Quality Board's move to create enforceable maximum containment levels for PFAS in drinking water ahead of federal standards. This process is a prime example of how states can enact laws that supersede federal law. We do not have to, and really must not accept the bare minimum of federal guidelines for or federal regulations as the threshold by which we protect ourselves. In the case of PFAS in drinking water, the Environmental Quality Board did more than the federal government to, pr to protect public drinking water by examining the risks to human health conducting the statewide testing program and talking to those impacted by the change in rules. We can and must use 
the results of the examination of risks to human health and the testing program to call for an end of the use of PFAS in the unconventional gas development industry and to call for an end to the use of hiding health-threatening toxicity under the mask of proprietary protection. It might seem daunting, yet we should remember that despite the industry's best efforts, the gag order for healthcare providers naming chemicals that they thought were impacting their residents in Act 13 was eventually and rightfully found unconstitutional. We should look at the findings in today's report as an unacceptable risk to public health that must be exposed and eliminated. Public health must supersede private profit-driven secrecy. In my opinion, the disclosure of the use of health-threatening chemicals should not only always have been mandatory, the use of health-threatening chemicals should be prohibited prior to use. I believe that the proportion the precautionary principle should be the logical law. If a company or an individual for that matter wants to use a chemical to create a product, it should be law that they provide that they prove that their chemical concoction is safe. If they cannot prove that basic safety measure, then they should have to go back to their profit driven drawing board and start again. The way we can do this here, the way that we do this in the United States is to allow products to hit the market or our watershed in the case of fracking and respond only in piecemeal fashion to health and safety concerns as we experience them, which makes us all sacrificial lambs. We can and must do better. Um, please uh, participate in the call to action. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Tammy. And that actually um, uh, teases up quite nicely for our last and final slide, uh, taking action. So based on comments and um, uh, the research that Dusty and others have done, uh, and um, based on some language that um, we wrote up uh, with with those Colorado laws in mind, we put together a call to action for everyone on this call to participate in. Please also share it with your friends and share it with your neighbors, um, particularly if you are in the shale fields, if you are living near waste sites, um, and really just anyone in Pennsylvania, um, because this can really um, cut down exposure from PFAS. Um, there was somebody in the chat that mentioned that you know there are multiple uh, opportunities for PFAS to be entered into our environment. However, um, you know, cutting down on these opportunities is, is of the utmost importance uh, based on what Tammy just said so eloquently. Um, so I want to go ahead and give some time for Q&A before we hop off our presentation tonight. Um, I'll ask that if you have a question, uh, if, you, if you would go ahead and either put your question in the chat or raise your hand, um, and then I can call on you one by one. Uh, and then any any of the presenters that would care to present uh, or or answer the question, um, you know, we can we can go around and and try to try to answer your questions as best as we possibly can tonight. Um, so. Uh, thank you also, Kevin, for putting in the link to uh, our call to action in the chat. Um, also, Kevin is going to pop in the link to the report itself um, so you can read the report thoroughly and use those tools that that Dusty talked about, uh, those wonderful mapping tools that Frack Tracker helped put together. Uh, we want to make sure that, um, you know, people have an opportunity to look at the report and to um, go through those tools. So uh, first up, we have um, B. Arendelle. Is that you, Barbara? Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Um... Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have my video on. I'm not quite ready for video. <laughs> oh, it's one of those days. Um, okay, a couple of things. Um, small correction for um, uh, Dusty, that vertical line is between Susquehanna County, PA, and Wayne County, PA, not New York. New York is across the Delaware River. Uh, most of Wayne, almost all of Wayne County is in the Delaware River Basin and has been prevented from uh, uh, allowing uh, waste. Uh, all of the Delaware River Basin um, does not allow the waste in. Um, if there's anything that might have some fracking chemicals um, in it, largely as a result of a lawsuit that DCS filed, um, 
because the Delaware River Basin um, wanted to allow the import of frac waste or import of oil and gas waste if there was from conventional wells. And we pointed out there's no such thing really as a conventional well defined this way, one place, that way, another place. So they backtrack, thankfully. Um, in Pennsylvania, there are also evaporators, pumps spraying the wastewater to evaporate it um, uh, in, in uh, uh, impoundments. Um, and I have two other points. One is that uh, the exemptions allow the um, companies to do all this with impunity. In the 1980s, the waste was made redefined as special, otherwise it would have come under the RICWA law. And um, then the additional exemptions in the 25 years later, in the 2005 um, Energy Policy Act, um, allow uh, the companies to be exempt from uh, oversight of major proportion, major portions of seven different um, protective laws. And this is one of the problems that everybody's, these are the problems everybody's facing. You can't get the information because they're exempt from the community right to know law, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into all that, but it's very important. Um, and um, Protect PT has some of our uh, DCS's Ohio Basin What's in the Water posters. Um, get in touch with them. They will distribute them. They have all about the exemptions and so on and so on and so forth with maps, everything up to date. It was produced last year. Please get these posters, get them out there. It's very important information. And um, I have a few other points, but I won't do them. Oh, one other point. Um, as a surfactant, um, is PFAS, is it cheaper? And that's why it's replaced the more expensive surfactants? That's, that's the a end. good question. We, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, I do appreciate the comment about the map, though, and, and we'll correct that in the future. Um, I also wanted to say briefly, Barbara, that, and to everybody, that um, the reason that our report focused only on unconventional gas wells is because those data are more readily accessible. Unfortunately, um, in Pennsylvania, the state has a separate chemical disclosure system for fracking chemicals used in what the state calls conventional wells, which are uh, some gas wells that are not... Um, uh, drilled in the same formation as the unconventional wells and are typically not fracked. And then any oil well is also a conventional well. Those fracking chemical disclosures um, have gone to four different locations. Some are online and then some are on paper in three different state offices. So it's much more cumbersome to get your hands on that disclosure data. Yeah, they make it as difficult as possible. The um, federal Energy Information Agency does say that over 94% of all oil and gas wells are fracked in part because they can and they're protected from liability. So bear that in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Dusty. Okay. And yes, um, we have um, many of those. Uh, it's called What's in the Water. This is excellent publication that that Barbara uh, put together. So uh, hit us up at um, protectpt.org. Info at protectpt.org is a great uh, email uh, to get any one of our staff members. Uh, and then Laurie Barr, you're on, you're on stack. Go ahead, Laurie. Hi. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I was just wondering if there are instruments that you could identify PFAS chemicals in the in the field. Uh, I could start on that one. Um, I have not done that myself, um, but um, I to measure PFAS especially at the very low concentrations at which it can be toxic. Um, my, my understanding is that that requires some fairly specialized equipment. Um, I would 
direct you to check with some chemists who are familiar with this type of testing. I can put you in touch if you want. Um, you can send an email, um, I guess, to Jillian or, or put your contact information in the chat. Um, but as we recommend in our report, um, you want to be able to look for PFAS at a, a concentration of at least a single digit parts per trillion or lower. And it may also make sense to test for what's called total organic fluorine, which is a catch-all type of test that would show the presence of some type of PFAS because there are thousands of PFAS that have been manufactured. So if you test only for like 18 or 30 some, which are two of the standard tests, it's possible that you might not test for the PFAS that could be in the water. So those are a couple of the uh, parameters to think about when doing the testing. Thank you, Dusty. Um, and I want to mention, so we have um, some testing of PFAS uh, in a creek near the um, the uh, Westmoreland Sanitary Landfill, um, and um, we they're called Cyclopure. They do take, you take a sample, and then you have to send it to the lab, and then it takes um, several weeks to, to find out, but <clears throat> we have found PFAS in that, in that stream, uh, and that is from the release of the leachate. As I spoke about earlier in my slides, the leachate uh, can contain PFAS, and this was a release of leachate that um, the landfill was cited for, and um, to Barbara's earlier point, uh, they were there actually is a plan at the Westmoreland Sanitary Landfill to evaporate their leachate in the air um, uh, in order to, to get rid of it. Um, and so we are fighting that as well. Uh, you can find more information on that on our website. Um, the next person with their hand raised is Tamala. Go ahead, Tamala, ask your question. Yeah, so mine um, uh, is about the testing as well. So I know there's um, uh, quite a few tests for uh, testing for PFAS in um, water and soils and 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 uh, fish and and everything. But um, for this, I know there's um, a lot of people who their property is near um, these well pads and they've gotten pictures of them leaking um and different things like that so is there a reason why we haven't collected soil and water samples from um from these areas especially ones that are um you know like abandoned or you know they've moved on from or on these people's physical property, personal property? Should I start on that one? Okay. Um, we're not, we can't be sure why, but our guess is that until Physicians for Social Responsibility published our first report on this issue in July of 2021, it was not well known that PFAS were used in oil and gas operations. And so they're probably, for that reason, there probably would not have been a lot of testing. Um, now that we do know, and it has been publicized in uh, multiple different states, uh, there is no excuse. Uh, and one of our recommendations is for uh, the state to get out there and find out if PFAS from these operations is getting into the environment. The two um, government tests that we're aware of involving oil and gas wells are one by the uh, Pennsylvania DEP um, at the property of Brian Lapkanich in Western Pennsylvania. Um, the DEP did find several types of PFAS in his well water. Um, th they, they said that they could not determine where it came from, and they speculated that one of the potential sources could have been the water that the company um, drilling on that property used for fracking, um, which might have already had PFAS in it. Um, it was taken, it could have been taken from a river in Western Pennsylvania and then injected into the well. Um, that's a troubling possibility. And Pennsylvania law does not require testing of that water for PFAS or other chemicals, and it should. Um, the other government test uh, just um, came out in 
August of 2023, it was a study by the U.S. Geological Survey and the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, they looked for PFAS in streams across Pennsylvania and found uh, PFAS concentrations in many of the streams. Uh, there were some PFAS concentrations in areas that had a lot of oil and gas drilling in them, but the result, the, the link between the two was a little inconclusive. Uh, from our perspective, it would the, this um, it would probably be better to look for PFAS concentrations in groundwater near oil and gas operations rather than surface water, as the DEP and USGS did. But that report just came out, and it's uh, worth looking at. I, I guess I don't mean government. I mean like um, uh, the NGO organizations. You know, whether it's Three River Keepers or. Susquehanna River Basin or you guys or something like that is what I'm asking because we have known about this since 2021 and so I'm just wondering why hasn't testing <clears throat> been done and if there has you know um where 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 is that we had um a set of uh PFAS tests that we gave out um, we did a series of town halls this year. We did five town halls and in each of the communities we offered any of the residents that were interested to take um, a PFAS test. And um, it's like, it was like pretty simple. Um, they just put the water in and sent it off and then got their results. Um, I was not in charge of tracking those results. Um, so they, they get the residents receive the results privately. Um, so I, I can't report back anything that was found there. Um, we only know what they tell us, really, but um, it was fairly simple. And if you're interested, Tamala, we can um, maybe speak offline and figure out. Um, we'd have to talk to Tinye Verkaitis, our executive director, and figure out where she got the tests. And um, like maybe we can order some more or something like that. Yeah, I, I know that, you know, when you do these tests, because it's so sensitive, like you have to be careful with like what pin you use, what paper you use, what you wear, no perfumes, your hair. I mean, it has to be so, so particular in order to get accurate results. So although, you know, just going off for that cyclopure test might give you some initial information um it's definitely not something that you could go to DEP and 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 you know unless it's like exorbitantly high you know um and have them really care about it uh because if just the regular person is going to be you know taking it from their spigot or whatever the data could be very well corrupted because just your cell phone for example you know on its screen has PFAS your glasses have PFAS on it. You know, PFAS oh, are like yeah. everywhere. Contact lenses, pretty yep, gross. Yep, exactly. Contact lenses, you name it. So, yeah. so yes. Yeah, so anyways, but yeah, I think we should get to doing a lot of testing. I'm working on stuff now and I'll talk to you later, Tammy. Thanks. Sounds good, Tamla. Thank you, Tamla. All right. So we have uh, one last question up here. If you uh, want to ask a question and you didn't get to it yet, please, this is the last call for questions. Um, so go ahead, Lois, and then we have one final announcement before we hop off tonight. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to recall if I remembered there is treatment. We've been talking about testing, but PFAS treatment in water um, it, I seem to have remembered hearing that in order to treat it, I have two questions. How many, if, if we can treat it, how many facilities across the United States are there? And is it true that it requires something like 700 degrees Celsius in order to treat it? I can answer this a little bit. Um, we have talked to an expert um, who was a former regulator in the state of Michigan, uh, where I live, who worked on PFAS contamination. And he said that the type of material that you use to take PFAS out of water is activated carbon, which is similar to what's in a Brita filter. Um, I don't know if that applies to every type of PFAS, but um, that's what he was familiar with using. 
And he said that the um, the, the drawback is you need a lot of this material. Um, it, it does get expensive. And once the material fills up with PFAS and you have to dispose of it, you have to make sure you do that in a place where it will not contaminate the environment all over again, such as through a landfill's leachate, as uh, Julian was talking about. Um, you, you really have to be careful. And he said that there were, it, it can be challenging to find a landfill that will accept that material. So it's much, much better to prevent the, um, the use of PFAS in the first place and the contamination in the first place, but there are ways to take it out of water. All right, thank you, Dusty. Um, all right, one we have one last question hand up from Tamala, and then I have a, a quick announcement before we hop off tonight. Go ahead, Tamala. Yeah, just a quick comment on that. Yes, Lois, there are um, evolving technologies that do use extreme amounts of energy and various methods of breaking up PFAS from point source pollution in addition to the activated carbon. But currently, right now, um, it's mostly the activated carbon, which, as Dusty said, is just a collection and not a destruction. Um, there's a lot of things in the pipeline. Um, so uh, you can stay tuned for that and you can um, reach out to me and I can give you what I have on that. Excellent. Sounds like we have a lot of knowledge on the call tonight. Um, I appreciate everyone sticking with us. Uh, I have an announcement before we hop off, though. Um, uh, halt the Harm has a new PFAS campaign accelerator. Um, so Halt the Harm is excited to announce their new PFAS campaign accelerator online course. This course gives you the knowledge you need to campaign effectively to protect communities from PFAS pollution created by the oil and gas industry. Um, it provides provides the necessary issue background along with workbooks to help you develop tactics and strategies to win your campaign. Uh, it's based on a live cohort, Hold the Harm, developed with topic experts and veteran campaigners. Um, it's a great resource for people who call, who on the call, who are dealing with PFAS pollution from oil and gas operations in their community. Uh, and you can go uh, to the core, you can join the course via the link in the chat uh, that, that, um, uh, that uh, Kevin just put in the chat here, and uh, if you're not on the halt, if you're not the a halt the harm member, you should sign up. Um, it is a great way to connect with other people and really keep this conversation going. Um, halt the harm is is uh, a, a wonderful tech guru um, that was here doing tech tonight, uh, and there's lots of wonderful resources they have online. Uh, so I want to encourage everyone to go to the halt the harm network, uh, sign up to become um, a member member of the network. Uh, you're going to get lots of valuable information uh, on there and you can sign up for their online course um, and really be able to start protecting your community uh, and learn from the, the wonderful knowledge that folks in the network have to give. Um, and uh, uh, okay, so Barbara has her hand raised real quick and then um, we're going to say our goodbyes tonight. So go ahead, Barbara. Okay, I had to unmute. Uh, one quick question um, um, for anybody who might be able to answer this. Um, could some of the PFAS use be a way to dispose of industrial waste? Um, okay, I'm not sure if I understand that question, but if anybody wants to raise their hand and answer, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'll I'll just say we we can't really be sure where it comes from, unfortunately. Yeah, that's Theo Coburn thought that a good portion of the toxic chemicals that are going that were going down wells that was of course a few years ago when she was alive, and I had a series of conversations with her about this, and she thought a lot of it was industrial waste and it was a cheap way to dispose of it. But I was wondering if there was any further look-see into that. So thank you very much. 
Thank you, Barbara. And thank you to everyone joining us tonight uh, to learn more about PFOS in Pennsylvania and the PSR report and what it means for your community. Uh, I want to thank Dusty Horowitz for his um, amazing pre presentation and knowledge that he shared tonight uh, for from Physicians for Social Responsibility National. I also want to thank Matt Kelso uh, the uh, from Frack Tracker Alliance, uh, Jackson Zeiler from the Environmental Health Project, Tammy Murphy uh, from Physicians for Social Responsibility, PA, and of course, Kevin and Ryan uh, for our tech backup from Halt the Harm Network. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I'm Jillian Graber from Protect PT. Uh, thank you and, and uh, keep, uh, keep moving on um, working in your communities and please take action on PFAS today. Have a great, have a great evening, everyone. Take care. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for facilitating, Jillian.